bonding a silicone skin to polyurethane foam. In this tutorial, we're going to explain the process of brushing a silicone skin into a sealed and released hydrocal mold. And then we're going to follow that up with a layer of flexible foam. And this is a technique that may be used to produce effects skins or large effects props with a silicone skin backed by flexible foam. And what we're going to do here is explain the process of bonding those two together because typically silicone does not want to stick to polyurethane and vice versa. Polyurethane foam doesn't want to stick to silicone. So in this tutorial, we'll, we'll explain the process of getting the two to stick together. And we're going to do that using the new 5110 silicone. This is a soft silicone skin material that's a low viscosity and ideal for simulating human skin. This cures to about a shore A10. So just quick review of the properties for 5110 platinum silicone. Of course, this is a platinum silicone, so you want to be careful what it comes in contact with. One to one mix ratio, of course, a 10 shore A and very low viscosity. This is a 2500 centipoise mixed viscosity. And of course, a 30 minute work time and a three to four hour demold. And that 30 minute working time is a very generous working time, especially if you're making large skins brushed into a large open face mold. It's really helpful for that. And of course, this can also be thickened with the Thixo thickener additive. And that is, of course, important anytime we're creating a brushed in skin or if we're chasing air bubbles and filling in voids and things like that. Now, to begin, we're using a hydrocal mold. Now, for the sake of this video, I'm just going to use the front half of the video because I want you to be able to see what's happening inside the mold. So we're going to be using the Bride of Biddy mold. This is a hydrocal mold that was sealed with mold soap and then sprayed with a light spray of Zip 301 mold release. Now, if you don't have either of those things, you can always use a very light layer of petroleum jelly. You just have to be very careful not to over apply that and fill in detail. Now, because this is going to require a couple of layers of silicone at least, we're going to go ahead and dispense uh, some silicone, both the A and the B, into some large mixing buckets. And we want to dispense more than we'll actually use just for safety here. And I'm going to mark these 5110 A and B on the buckets. And you can also do that on the stir sticks, just so you don't accidentally cross-contaminate with the stir sticks. But real important, you want to make sure you mark your buckets A and B. And what we're going to do is dispense that uh, A and B into those respective buckets, and then we're going to color those independent of each other. Now, the reason for doing this is so that when we mix this all together, everything becomes one uniform color. And obviously, if you're just using an off-the-shelf silicone pigment, not too big of a deal. But if you're making a custom color, especially like we're doing here where you're using a, a silicone pigment plus flocking colors, then mixing up uh, subsequent batches, if you get that off, there's going to be a noticeable difference between those layers. And especially if you're doing a large skin that might require several batches, you don't want it to look like a patchwork quilt. So real important to little trick here for making sure that everything matches. Now we're going to create a fairly fair skin tone. So we could start out with a uh, our silicone pigment, our flesh tone, but the problem with that is then we would wind up adding white to that and then we'd have to monkey with that a little bit to knock it down from that normal flesh tone. So in order to get a very fair flesh tone, I start with white pigment and then I bring it up to where I want it to be by adding flocking colors. And the, the flocking colors I typically use for this is the, the flesh tone, the tan, the red, and sometimes a little bit of yellow, and sometimes even a little bit of green. We have a lot of different flocking colors you can use to tweak that accordingly. But what I'm doing here is I'm creating two little uh, similar piles of flocking on the top of those batches of A and B. And 
you obviously don't have to be accurate down to the individual fiber or anything that accurate, but you want overall, you want the silicone to be the same color in both buckets. So that way you don't have any change once those go together. Because if you were to just pigment the part A or the part B, when you add the other component to it, uh, sometimes that makes it a little bit more translucent. So this way you can dial in the exact color. And then again, you don't have any change when those two components go together and more importantly you don't have any change between batches so again this in this process here we're going to be using two layers of silicone and we don't want those to look separate from each other now another important note is remember that when you're adding things like pigment and flocking into two components like this that are not being immediately mixed together if those sit for a long period of time, those uh, components will start to settle out, especially the white pigment, which is really dense. So be aware of that, that the flocking and the pigment can separate over time. So anytime you go to use that batch, make sure you stir that up before mixing it with the A or B. So again, make sure that you mix those each before you mix them with each other. Now, once we have our two components ready to go, we're ready to mix this up and start brushing it into our mold. And again, 5110 is mixed one to one. And weight is always my go to for this sort of thing. There's uh, a lot of these materials that are one to one. A lot of the silicones that are one to one could be done one to one by weight or volume. But I really like the uh, weight. I really prefer weight ratio over volume, especially in really small batches, because when you're working in really small amounts, uh, it's really hard to eyeball that correctly. And that's where you can start losing some of those physical properties if you're off by a little bit. So real important, be as accurate as possible. Now, important to remember that 5110, as it comes, when you mix up your A and B component, it will be a runny liquid. And again, a very low viscosity runny liquid. So uh, it's not until we add that Thixo that it converts it over to a brushable paste. Now, I typically add probably not even 1% uh, into this. And because you have that long working time of uh, 30 minutes, you have more than enough time to get everything thoroughly mixed together, both the A and the B, scraping the sides and the bottom of the mixing cup, of course. But also we have plenty of time to adjust the uh, thixotropic quality of the material. So if we want it to be a little thicker, we add just add a little bit more thixo. I typically don't recommend going over over about 1% though. Now, one of the reasons we're brushing this in two layers, and we could even use three or four layers if necessary, is to minimize air entrapment on that surface. So obviously here, this isn't for anything critical, but real important to get that brush in there and really scrub that surface and make sure you don't have any surface bubbles on uh, where the silicone is meeting that hydrocal mold. And obviously places around the mouth and the nostrils and the ears, those are gonna be most likely to trap air bubbles. But the main thing here is by applying this in a fairly thin layer first and then going back and building that up, that keeps us from uh, really piling it on thick and then trapping air bubbles up against the mold surface. So that's why we're doing this in two layers. You could, technically you could all do this in one layer, but again, it's just much better practice to do this in a couple of layers. Now, this is again, more for the sake of this video than uh, how I would normally do it, but I'm brushing it up on the flange for two reasons. One is just to give myself a place to check and see when it's cured, but also to protect that flange because when I pour the foam in later, since I'm not gonna be closing the mold completely and strapping it. I don't want to get uh, flexible foam on that exposed hydrocal seam and of course having that flexible foam stick to it tenaciously because one of the things about flexible foam is it doesn't want to stick to silicone but it wants to stick to everything else in the same zip code. So real important here again this isn't how you would typically be doing this but you should probably be working with a closed mold but uh, for the video here I always like to protect that uh, flange as much as possible. And again, you can obviously see how you would do this with a two-piece mold is brushing it in the two halves and then the last layer putting a little bit up on the flange and then clamping those together. Now, we have a 30 minute working time, but we don't have to wait the full three to four hours before brushing more silicone into the mold. 
So in this case, as soon as it's to a point where I can tap on a little bit and it might be a little tacky, but I'm not able to move it around with my finger, that's when it's ready for another layer of silicone. Again, much like a brush on mold. We brush in our first layer, let that at least gel. And in this case, that took about uh, an hour and a half or so. And then we're ready to mix up a second layer to brush on top of that. And you notice we got that nice and thick and now we're ready to brush that in. And again, now because we're not brushing it right up against the mold surface, we don't have to be as careful about air entrapment because we're not really going to see what uh, the any air bubbles between these two layers. This is more just to add strength to our silicone skin. Now, this is where timing is important. Obviously, we have that 30-minute working time, which is great for what we're about to do here, which is once we get that silicone in place, we're going to put some cotton fiber and embed that in, into it. And you see those cotton balls to the left there. What I've done is if you just go buy standard cotton balls from a drugstore, you can actually unroll those. So they're actually little strips of cotton fiber rolled up into a ball. So you take those and carefully unroll those and you wind up with these little strips. And that allows us to take those strips and just press those into the silicone um, once we've finished brushing that all over the inside of our mold. Now this step must be done while the silicone is still uncured or uh, well before it starts to gel. And that just ensures that that uh, silicone really soaks into that cotton fiber. And if you're working with a multiple piece mold, you want to do this and then close the mold. Make sure you have everything in place and then seal up your mold. Um, so again, the whole point of doing this with an open faced one half of the mold is just so you can see what's happening for this video. Now the way this works is because silicone will naturally repel polyurethane and polyurethane uh, will naturally repel silicone, uh, the way we get a bond between those two dissimilar surfaces is by this cotton fiber creates a mechanical linkage between those two surfaces. So by pressing this into that wet silicone, and then allowing that to cure, what we wind up with is the silicone grabs onto one side of that fiber, holding it in place. So once we press that all over the inside of the surface of the mold, we let that set up completely, and then we're ready to peel out the rest of the cotton. So even if you pull out as much cotton as you possibly can, you're still going to wind up with those little hairs left behind. And that is exactly the point. We're going to wind up with those little cotton fibers sticking out of the silicone, which then create a perfect place for our urethane foam to grab onto later on. So that's how that works. Now, it does require a little bit of planning, depending on the uh, configuration of your mold that you're working with. Obviously, if you're doing a large closed mold, you need to make sure you can reach inside and grab that cotton to pull it back out. And in some cases, you only have to do this technique around key areas, like if you're making a head or a body or something, sometimes it might just be in places where the silicone's going to move a lot or... Uh, you know, or where the silicone dead ends, you don't want it to accidentally peel away, things like that. So you don't necessarily have to do this all over the surface of a skin. It really comes down to the individual part as to what is going to be necessary. So here I pulled away most of the cotton fiber, and now I'm ready to mix up and pour my foam. Now for the flexible foam, we're going to be using TC266 variable density flexible foam. And this is a variable ratio foam. And what that means is we can actually mix this up in a three pound up to a five pound density, depending on what we need it to do. So this is a very versatile foam system and it results in a very soft, pliable foam. We have a lot of customers that do uh, even creature suits and things like that out of it because it's so soft and flexible. Also very good for uh, puppet fabrication and that sort of thing, but very good, soft, flexible foam that has a softness that uh, is almost like a foam latex. Now we're going to add a little bit of pigment to this. We're going to add some of our brown polypig, and this is just a very concentrated polyurethane pigment. We're just going to add a little bit of that to the base, 
and we could also add some flesh tone or something like that but just a little bit of this we just want to make it not be bright white so I just mixed a few drops of the color in there and I'm mixing that into the base and this is a very small batch to give you an idea this is 100 parts of the B to 50 parts of the A so we're mixing it in the three pound density for those curious, you can mix it 100B to 30A for a five pound density. Now you'll see I have a throwaway chip brush and I'm going to use that to spread the foam around and push it into the cotton fiber. Now, again, if you're dealing with a large mold that's closed, the pressure developed inside that mold will help the foam integrate with the uh, cotton fibers. But all of this is where your artistry and your creativity comes into play because a lot of these techniques will need to be adjusted based on the mold you're working with. So in this case, again, this is a fairly straightforward. We're going to actually brush it into that surface. But this also works for a lot of body props and things like that, torsos and things where uh, only one side is going to be visible to camera and you could brush in a layer of foam behind it. But we're going to do this really fast because those of you who have worked with uh, flexible foams, so you know the drill. It expands really quick. So we want to get it out of the mixing bucket and into the mold and then leave it alone and let it expand. Now, one thing I always like to do is let the uh, silicone skin set up for at least five hours or so before I do that foam backing. And that just ensures that that fresh silicone skin doesn't accidentally do anything to contaminate the flexible foam because I have seen that happen in some cases. So real important, file that away just in case you ever run into that. Sometimes fresh silicone can cause... Uh, the polyurethane foam to collapse. And there we have our finished silicone skin bonded to our flexible foam. So you can see we squeeze that around and everything stays together. And obviously if you were to really work at it, you might be able to rip the two apart, but we get a really good connection between our skin and that flexible foam underneath. Now it's important to remember if we're going to be painting this part, it's really critical that you uh, make sure whatever release you use, that you're able to clean that off so you can paint your part after the fact. So stay tuned, we'll be posting a painting tutorial soon. But in the meantime, it's always important to know that all the materials used in our tutorials are available on our website at brickintheyard.com. So be sure to visit the links in the video description. We'll put everything down there. And of course, some of you newcomers that might be looking for additional content on this process or some of our older videos, some of those have been moved over exclusively to the video library on our website. So be sure to check the link in the video description. And as always, uh, as YouTube uh, customs would have it, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already and click the little bell icon so you get notified when we post new content. And thanks again for watching.